We are live with SCI TV. I'm Joshua Gordon of the Sports Conflict Institute, joined today by my guest, Anjan Chatterjee of UPenn. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. So today's topic is a particularly interesting one, going into the neuro space in sports and talking about some of the ideas of smart drugs and some of the next frontier, potentially, of performance enhancement. Before we get into our conversation, I'm hoping you could share a little bit about how you got into this space professionally. Sure. Uh, I'm a neurologist by training. I'm a professor of neurology at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm also a cognitive neuroscientist. And so my research is around how cognition works in the brain, various aspects of how our mind works. And in the context of that, uh, probably about, I would say, maybe about uh, 12, 15 years ago, a group of people at Penn started to think about ways in which advances in neuroscience and neurotechnologies uh, can have effects on how people live in the world outside of what we think about in medicine uh, and some of the ethical implications of that. And so that led us to think, among other things, in an area that I've focused on for the last dozen plus years is really how, uh, what are the consequences? Uh, first of all, what's, what are we able to do as far as enhancing our abilities, and what are the potential ethical consequences of that? And yeah, so I think that provides a really nice framework for our conversation. Let's start with uh, what are we able to do? I think you know people have some hints and they hear noises about what's possible. I think people have a much greater sense of what's done on the pharmacological side, but what what can we do now and where are we heading on that side of it? Sure. So everybody knows the kind of traditional things that one does to try to enhance their performance on a variety of ways, which is, you know, you work hard, you train, you sleep, you know, make, make sure you get adequate sleep, you, you have a decent diet. You know, those are all the traditional things uh, that people have done. I think the question around pharmacology uh, centers around various aspects of either our physical performance or our mental performance that aids uh, in physical performance. Uh, people have certainly for years heard about doping and there are different ways in which uh, athletes can dope to improve their performance. Uh, and so that's, that's a landscape that has been around for a long time. What's changing are the, the kinds of drugs that are available uh, to do that. And then further, if we look down on the horizon, there are non-pharmacologic uh, techniques uh, which we can talk about if we get to them, uh, where one can try to manipulate aspects of our brain directly uh, uh, that might have those kinds of enhancing effects. So when we're talking about performance enhancing, obviously there's some things that are permissible and, and allowed and some that are, are not. You know, for, for years, part of the culture of different sports has been to use these substances. If you looked at baseball, we talked about greenies and amphetamines as a big part of the baseball culture. That's been something that they've at least made a, an outward attempt to crack down on. Uh, I suspect the number of the individual sports where performance really comes down to the very small margins of difference, that's become a big part of it as well. Where, where from your perspective, are we drawing that line between what's permissible and what's not permissible? permissible? Yeah, it's a tough question and you can take it into different domains. So for example, if we remove the, question from sports per se, uh, as, as, as you and many of your listeners probably know that the use of stimulants is quite common on college campuses. So uh, things like uh, Adderall, Ritalin, uh, the kinds of medications that are used in attention deficit disorder are used as performance enhancing drugs on college campuses. Uh, and depending on, you know, where you look, it's hard to get uh, concrete numbers, but anywhere uh, for up to 25% of, of college students uh, uh, at some point avail themselves of these kinds of drugs. When it comes to sports, uh, often these drugs are used. Uh, they are, uh, you know, typically used in more explosive kinds of sports. So um, my impression is that uh, if, say, track and field, a sport that I know more about than others, uh, you know, sprinters and some of the field events are more likely to use those kinds of drugs than distance uh, events would be my guess. But uh, 
you know, but but there's been, as you point out, a long tradition of different kinds of doping, and some things people find uh, acceptable. So an example would be uh, beta blockers. Uh, so these are drugs that uh, were originally designed as medications for high blood pressure, and one of the consequences of that is that they they diminish our uh, slight tremors that people might have, right? And it's it's something that uh, people, that musicians use this very commonly before performances, that they will take beta blockers because if they're playing the piano or the violin, any slight tremor might have an effect uh, on their performance. And the other thing it does is that it actually decreases people's level of anxiety. So a lot of public speakers, uh, you know, I'm in academia, people give public talks all the time, and in surveys of Americans, uh, it turns out that public speaking is something that many people are really anxious about. And beta blockers help for that. In the context of sports, it, it turns out that golfers, for example, will use beta blockers because that slight bit of tremor might make a big difference on the putting green. And people are aware of that, but don't seem to be so bothered by that. Um, another kind of enhancement would be when people have uh, retinal surgery to improve their vision. Uh, so you can actually uh, improve your vision to better than 2020. And in some sports, uh, again, I'm told in baseball, this happens with some, uh, I'm not sure what the numbers are, but it happens. Uh, and people don't seem to be bothered by that sort of enhancement, right? So in both these situations, whether it's beta blockers or uh, this kind of retinal surgery, you're getting people to perform better than they otherwise would with whatever their nat natural biology is. Uh, but when it get comes to things like anabolic steroids or amphetamines, people start to get uncomfortable. And generally, at least in most sports, uh, you know, those are regarded as banned substances. You know, exactly why that is, is not clear, and it's worth talking about, but there is something that, that the, our culture in general seems to, to make a distinction, which at the end of the day, whether that bears out on a principled account is not so clear to me. That's a very interesting point that you're making in that we have a very strong reaction to certain performance enhancing substances, steroids being the number one, but HGH and some of the others that are out there. Um, certainly track and field, the Olympic sports, they have a, a very broad range of things that are banned and it's clear and they're listed out. But it does seem like the space where we're talking about neuro and, and you know, thinking improvement, cognitive improvement, seems to not bother folks so much. Any, any thoughts as to why that might be from your perspective? Well, I think the, the anabolic steroids are a good example uh, where there are clear physical differences that are observable, right? So people, can, you know, their muscles get more ripped uh, and there's a kind of... Uh, accompaniment to that that can also have uh, neural effects. So people get more aggressive, uh, people can, you know, and that can can become problematic. Uh, but there is a way in which I think the physical changes that are evident when people use anabolic steroids, uh, there, there's a, a concrete manifestation of it that I think is what partly what people find uncomfortable. I think the drugs that have a, a, an effect on the brain without the same immediately obvious physical change is where people are, uh, you know, it's not so clear uh, that people, uh, what people think about it. Uh, there are some people that kind of have a belief in a general notion of fairness in sports. And one can question whether that ever exists, right? You know, athletes come with different genetic endowments. They grow up in different environments. They have different, uh, different coaching, they have different access to technology. The idea that in mo most sports that there is something of a play level playing field is far from clear. Nonetheless, most of us hold on to that kind of notion that there is a level playing field and there is the sense that if you're taking drugs that might help you, there's something unfair about that uh, that diminishes the sport. And I think where you draw the line on that uh, is, for, to me, seems like a cultural thing. Uh, you can take uh, weightlifting, for example, or bodybuilding as a good example, right? Body, in bodybuilding, the use of anabolic steroids is pretty endemic. 
and you know you have separate competitions for sort of natural bodybuilding, right? But those don't get nearly the kind of attention that uh, you know that bodybuilding, where people use anabolic steroids, do. Uh, so that's a you can say that's a little cultural niche in which the community of that sport has decided it's okay, right? But as you point out, in track and field, we say it's not okay. Uh, and if you extend that to not just drugs, but the kinds of, um, you know, the kinds of technologies that you might consider uh, enhancing of performance. In track and field, you can say when in the pole vault, when people moved to fiberglass poles, that was considered fine, right? And, and if you look at the records in the pole, pole vault, shortly after that, there was this big jump in how high people were able to vault because of this technology that people were using. Uh, on the other hand, uh, various kinds of swimsuits that have buoyant properties were, were deemed as not allowable uh, in, the, in the last Olympics. Uh, and then you had the story of Oscar Pistorius, who had a prosthetic leg, which was regarded as allowable, but that was really controversial, right? At what point does a, as this technology develops, does a prosthetic leg get to the point where uh, there might be advantages uh, to a runner that uh, someone without a, a prosthetic uh, leg wouldn't have. How would we deal with that? And I find this, it, it, this um, it's very hard to come out with a principled account of why certain things should be allowed and certain things shouldn't be allowed, other than people seem to have a kind of gut reaction to this. And the governing bodies, for the most part, I think are responding to that kind of communal and cultural gut reaction. But it could be over time that gut reaction changes as people get more comfortable with this. Uh, you know, that kids that grow up, for example, in high school using stimulants, and they call it, uh, you, know, it you know, outside of Philadelphia, I'm told kids call them study aids, right? It's not even thought of as a drug, it's a study aid, right? As this generation gets older uh, and in positions of administrative uh, authority, it could be that 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 sensibility changes, and and we're not as uh, you know we're not as focused or as uh, what's the right word um, we're not as bothered by people taking these kinds of drugs. I don't know if that will play out. Um, my general point is that whether you regard it as acceptable or unacceptable is probably more of a uh, a social norm. Than anything that can be argued on a principled account. That's a it's a very nuanced conversation in a lot of ways, and certainly that line has shifted. At, at one point, if you were to watch the Boston Marathon, they were not allowed to uh, take water in. That was considered a performance enhancing banned substance, and you know that's laughable now. People have lots yeah. of substances out there. Uh, caffeine has become just part of the culture of almost every sport, and probably isn't that far off some of the benefits of some of the other amphetamines and things that you're you're talking about. Is it a line about safety that, that needs to be drawn? I mean, I think one of the questions comes down to a debate about safety. I, I teach at the University of Oregon and I had a faculty member stop by my office and he was giving me a litany of all the substances he's on just to be able to, you know, rock his weekend hikes a little bit stronger. And yeah. uh, I, I continue to compete, so I, I dare not go down the road he goes down. But uh, he felt very strongly that he had found the fountain of youth. And I, I had a lot of hesitation saying, well, are you putting yourself at risk from a safety standpoint? I didn't really have the answers for him. And I guess I, I put that back on you a bit of, you know, what are some of the safety considerations around some of these, whether they're the physical enhancers or the smart drugs that we're talking about? Sure. So safety is always an issue. Uh, so with anabolic steroids, uh, the 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 potential side effects are relatively well known. Uh, I mentioned some of the psychiatric potential side effects. Uh, people can get very irritable. People can get manic. Uh, some people can actually get quite violent. Uh, you know, so those are the kinds of uh, effects that people can have with steroids. And when they stop it, they can crash and get depressed. The uh, the physical effects uh, for men. Uh, you can get testicular atrophy. There is a, a potential danger of impotence. Uh, it can affect people's hearts, livers, uh, uh, kidneys. You know, all of those have been reported. So those are non-trivial effects. 
uh, in women, in addition to affecting, you know, potentially affecting hearts, livers, kidneys, uh, women can have the effects of essentially of testosterone, of, of the male sex hormone, where uh, develop more facial hair, uh, start to develop male pattern balding. So those are the kinds of physical effects one can see uh, with anabolic steroids, and plus things like acne and uh, uh, you know those kinds of cosmetic effects as well. With stimulants, it's a little less clear uh, in terms of physical effects. The when uh, it's been now, I think it was around 2008 that the FDA put black box warnings on both Adderall and Ritalin, the two most commonly used uh, uh, stimulants, and those were put on uh, because of the what at the time was thought to be very small but serious uh, uh, potential adverse effects. One was developing cardiac arrhythmias. So, you know, these are abnormal heart rhythms where people can, you know, keel over and die, basically. Uh, and the other was the potential for addiction. Uh, you know, all of these are amphetamine-like substances, and since amphetamine is a drug that can commonly be abused, the, the worry is that these drugs would be, could become drugs of abuse. Since then, there have been uh, a couple of very large population-based studies that at least and this is both in young adults uh, and in, in children and late adolescents. Uh, and, you know, based on both those studies, it looks like the cardiac effects are probably not as, uh, uh, as prevalent as was initially thought. And so from that standpoint, they probably are safer than we used to think even 10 years ago. There is one caveat, though, which is that the way those drugs work is by increasing our arousal systems, our arousal systems in the brain, but also in our body. And the one question that remains unanswered is that athletes often, before they're starting their event or their sport uh, or their competition, are naturally revved up, right? You get up, you know, you get, you know, you know, you get up for your event, you get psyched for it. What we don't know is once you have that endogenous arousal and then you throw on this added pharmacology on top of that that's going to further boost that arousal, whether in that very specific instance would the incidence of cardiac effects, uh, would the risk of the cardiac effects be greater than if you just look at large populations of people you know, that are in schools taking this, right? You don't have that same setup where, where the person is inherently getting pumped up right before they're, they're about to perform. So we just don't know the answer to that specific question. Um, the other is that not everybody, uh, you know, ends up benefiting from these drugs. There are some people that are naturally hyped where the drugs actually throw them over uh, and, and actually ends up being performance uh, inhibiting rather than enhancing. Uh, you know, so that's one thing to consider. And then long-term kinds of issues is that these drugs typically inhibit appetite. So whether for an athlete over the long run, whether this would have an effect on their diet, uh, you know, that's at least something to pay attention to. And the other is sleep, right? If you take, the, you know, if you're going to be training later in the afternoon and you start taking these, this affects your sleep. You know, so then your sleep is interrupted. That affects your performance. Then you take another enhancing drug to counteract the effects of sleep deprivation, you can imagine a way in which people would get into the spiral of chasing the side effects of the drugs with other drugs and so on and so forth. So one of the things that you and I chatted about before we went on air was that we can start to, as we look in the not too distant future, move away from some of the pharmacological solutions towards these to um, other technology-based solutions towards the same kind of performance enhancing. And we've seen this in other realms. If you look at track and field, EPO is a banned substance. The concept of blood doping, which would get you at the same end, is you know, a banned process. And yet you could sleep in altitude tents or train at altitude to get some of those same benefits. And folks have been OK with that. So in some ways, that frontier, we've seen some ways in which technology can get you out of the, uh, you know, the forbidden zone and into a permissible zone of, of enhancement. What, what are your thoughts, or can you share with us some of what's coming down the pipeline and, and what that might mean? 
Yeah, so the thing that's coming down the pipeline are a set of technologies that you know, fall under the rubric of non-invasive brain stimulation. And what this is is using devices that you place on the surface of our head, uh, on the skull, uh, to either stimulate or inhibit parts of the brain underlying that. And there are two, generally two kinds of techniques now that are used. One is using a magnetic uh, impulse or a set of magnetic pulses, and the other is using direct current stimulation. And the, the second of those, and it's often referred to as TDCS, transcranial direct stimulation, is technically very easy to do. Uh, you know, there are videos on YouTube of how to build this yourself. It's not that expensive. For about 100 bucks, you can, you know, set up a whole gear. Uh, you can buy these commercially uh, for around $300. And the idea there, at least in laboratory settings, uh, the idea is that you can apply these in certain parts of the brain and improve certain kinds of abilities. What's relevant to sports is that there have been some studies that showed that, you, that in, again, in laboratory settings, various kinds of motor learning, where people are learning complicated motor uh, behaviors, that you actually enhance how quickly people learn this by giving them these kinds of pulses. And in this one study, that was fairly high profile study uh, uh, that brought people in and gave them this kind of stimulation. I think it was 15 or 20 minutes for five days, right? You come in, they're learning this, this task for five days. And what they could show that the people who got this kind of stimulation learned the task much more quickly than people who are given a kind of placebo or sham stimulation. And not only that, three months later, they were brought back and they still were performing better than the sham folks, right? Now, it's one study, it's a laboratory-based study, and there are other lab-based studies that uh, suggest this might be possible. But it raises the distinct possibility that in various kinds of motor learning and motor performance tasks, that this, these kinds of techniques could be used to enhance people's performance. Um, whether that would work in the field, we don't know. Uh, but it's not so difficult to conceive that this could become part of people's training regimens. Uh, and what's, it raises a certain kind of challenge. I think we were talking uh, before about how, you know, most sports like the Olympics and sports have various drug screening uh, protocols and often they're trying to catch up with what the latest, you know, drug of abuse is in sports. Um, but for this kind of technology, uh, in principle, at least for the foreseeable future, there is no way, there's no biologic marker, there's no signal that says that you, for example, had this done, uh, you know, 20 minutes before this, uh, this interview, right? There's, there's, no, there's no way to detect it. And so I think it raises a new set of questions, which is if these kinds of techniques do actually turn out to help people's performance or improve their performance. And that's a big if. I don't want to want people to, your listeners to go out and start, you know, finding these rigs. But if that helps and there is no way to detect that, how do we deal with that, right? Do we then capitulate and say anything goes? Because if you can't, if you can't enforce it, if you can't govern it, uh, you know, how do we as a, as a culture, as a sports culture, how do we, how do we address that? And I would leave that to you and your and your audience to to ponder. I always have that image of that famous Saturday Night Live sketch of the All Drug Olympics, yeah. where they essentially listed all the substances he's on, and he goes for the deadlift, and his arms fall off. And you know, it's a little tongue in cheek, but it, it's actually in some ways a little close to reality of where we may be heading. Yeah. Um, yeah. As we wrap up our conversation, uh, I want to invite you to share any final thoughts you have on the subject, and also. Uh, ways in which our audience can continue to follow your thought leadership, uh, whether it's research or just daily musings you might share to the world as well. Well, my, my thoughts about this general topic, uh, it's, uh, I had actually coined a term called cosmetic neurology to kind of describe this general category of ways in which techniques that are often designed to try to help people with disease or, 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 or conditions that might be treated are used in people that uh, you know, don't have a condition in it to uh, to make people uh, 
um, sort of better than uh, what their normal state is. Uh, ultimately, I think these are, as I mentioned before, these are predicated on what our societal norms are, which is why I think people should be thinking about this uh, and, and, and trying to come to some resolution with, within themselves and their local communities of what they think the right thing is, because uh, this is not an issue that's adjudicated by by scientists, uh, you know, or physicians, I think this really is how, what, as a culture, what do we want, right? That's really uh, what, what it'll boil down to. Uh, as far as uh, following uh, my own work, I have a lab website uh, that, uh, uh, if you Google my name, you can find it. It's on. It, it's within the University of Pennsylvania um, uh, Center for Cognitive Neuroscience. Uh, and I also have a, a Twitter account, which is at Anjan, my first name, uh, Anjan435. I think it's at Anjan435. Great. And we'll make sure to share that as well with our audience. Thank you so much for the wonderful conversation. I really appreciate your time and energy. Sure thing. Great to be here.